By the time most of Lee's men had gotten back into Virginia, the news of events happening in Mississippi had reached the army. Vicksburg, the strong bastion along the Mississippi River, had fallen. Vicksburg was a product of Western soldiering and campaigning where wide sweeping movements often culminated in a battle a hundred miles from a previous engagement. The distances seemed to have been greater and in the early phases of the war in the West, controlling the riverways. There was no doubt at the time that Grant was the right man for the job in the West. His victories in 1862, Forts Henry and Donaldson, and then Shiloh, launched Grant's career, and along with some other subordinates, such as General William T. Sherman, would offer a tandem stronger, perhaps, than Lee and Jackson. That cooperation was needed to crack the Gibraltar of Vicksburg that everyone all the way up to President Jefferson Davis knew was the nail head that kept the two sides of the river together. If the city was taken, it would surely give the entirety of the waterway control to the Federal Army and Navy. The first actions against it would come in December when Sherman took his command, split from Grant's, and with those 32,000 men, came in from the south. Grant, with 40,000 men, would come in from the north, or the direction of Holly Springs, the federal base of operations. By the start of the April campaign against Vicksburg, Grant's Army of the Tennessee would consist of approximately 75,000 men. His primary opponent, General John Pemberton, a Pennsylvanian loyal to his new home in the South, commanded approximately 44,000 men of the Army of the Mississippi. General Joseph Johnston, the senior field commander in the campaign, attempted to coordinate with Pemberton, and to Johnston's dismay, Pemberton failed to accomplish anything. With additional victories against the forces of Pemberton at Champions Hill and then Big Black River on May 16th and 17th, respectively, Grant seemed to be leading an unstoppable force. His men eventually bullied Pemberton's men back into their fortifications at Vicksburg. This set the stage for the first assaults on the defenses there. Johnston wanted Pemberton to save the army over the city, but Pemberton refused and planned to make the price of taking the city too high for Grant. On May 22nd, elements from Grant's army tested the defenses of Vicksburg. This type of attack was exactly what the defenders wanted, and the Confederate defenders inflicted 3,200 casualties in a matter of a few hours. It convinced Grant that he would lay on a siege against Pemberton. Rear Admiral David Dixon Porter would join in on the investment of the city with his gunboats, designed for using mortars and arching shot and shell as Vicksburg sat atop a bluff. The men in the ranks were not unused to digging in and getting dirty, but this settled down style of military activity would be well remembered by the men in blue. One soldier, Lucius Barber of the 15th Illinois Infantry, carefully recalled the development of his engineering skills on the Vicksburg lines. It would be typical of the vast majority of Grant's men. He wrote, One day General Grant rode along the line and told the boys he had plenty of ammunition and not to be afraid to use it. This was the signal for firing. Some of the boys expended over 200 rounds that day. The Rebs lay in their trenches whilst like mice, not daring to show their heads. Some evenings we would crawl to the top of the hill near camp and watch the gunboats shell the city. From the instant the shell left the gun, we could trace its progress through the air. The terrified inhabitants sought safety in caves from these terrible engines of death. A practical engineer could so time the fuse to explode the shell whenever he wished. There were weeks and weeks of skirmishing, constant sharpshooting, and occasionally a pitched sortie against the position just to test its strength. Ultimately, it would be the continued strain on the population, the reduced rations of the troops, and the knowledge that the Union Army was only getting stronger that made the garrison begin to wonder how this siege could possibly end with anything other than a surrender. For the 4,000 or more residents still within the city, they certainly would have been under similar thoughts 
but they were civilians and did not sign up to be shot at. With no relief coming and the people in the city resorting to eating rats and horses, Pemberton waited only until the first days of July to begin entertaining the thought of meeting with U.S. Grant to discuss terms for surrender. The 4th of July was a momentous day in American history to both Northerners and Southerners. But on that day, in 1863, General John Pemberton made a decision that would profoundly shake Southern morale and alter the course of the war in the West. Pemberton decided to surrender Vicksburg and give it to Grant and to the Army of the Tennessee. The Army of Mississippi surrendered approximately 30,000 men and 172 artillery pieces of all sorts, especially dozens of siege guns. The news of both Gettysburg and Vicksburg was spread throughout the North. Church bells in the cities from Chicago to Boston and all points of the Union rang out. The Eastern and Western armies had both won momentous fields against the Confederate armies. It was a turning point in the conflict, or at least it gave the Northern leadership and population renewed fervor to prosecute the war. And in the South, the words Gettysburg and Vicksburg were uttered in sad, hushed expressions. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.